Hello from California, and thank you to Coda for inviting me to speak today. It's really a, an honor and a privilege for me to address this group. I run the news ecosystem products at Google, but uh, many years ago, uh, too, too many to count now, I started my career as a fact checker at the New Yorker magazine, uh, which was a deeply formative experience for me. And, and so the journalistic craft of sourcing and research being sure of your facts uh, has been an abiding interest of mine over the years. And maybe even more broadly uh, than that, I think the epistemological problem, like how do we know things? How do we come to certainty about them? And how do we seek to convince others of the truth of our convictions has also uh, been a little bit of an obsession for me. Um, I think if you're a person who is watching the news these days, it's really, uh, it's kind of an unavoidable thought, right? We're really at this sort of fulcrum moment globally when it comes to questions of how societies come to understand reality, how they share knowledge in order to have a common vision of themselves and of the world. Uh, both the tech industry and the news and media industries are, are playing really large parts in the drama of you know, maybe what we could call social epistemology. And uh, frankly, it doesn't look like any of us are doing a really great job at it because because we see, you know, with every passing year, uh, it feels like there's less consensus about what's real, what facts are true, uh, who can be trusted to report them. And at a moment like this, it seems really imperative that institutions work together to try to understand the nature of the problem and build new structures of transparency to provide greater clarity to citizens and more oversight both of their governments, uh, but also of the institutions themselves. At the same time, this seems like absolutely the last thing that anyone is likely to do at this moment because the institutions themselves don't fully trust each other. I'm sorry to say that I'm not coming here with the grandiose solution to the problem. I, I don't believe there will be a deus ex machina moment when blockchain or AI or Silicon Valley venture capital descends from the heavens and comes down upon the profession of journalism, thereby rescues liberal democracy. Uh, rather, I plan to spend the balance of this time reflecting on the smaller ways that we can help make uh, things better in spite of there being no magical overarching solution. We're all, of course, citizens of different countries and political partisans, employees of corporations, adherents of religions, and we're also still free individuals and we can make our own decisions and invest in our own relationships and take our own leaps of faith. And these individual acts are not without consequences as to whether events conspire to the good or whether they conspire to the bad. I was uh, recently thinking back um, at, at that now long journey that took me from my post as a 22-year-old fact checker at The New Yorker uh, and then on to writing talk of the town stories for that magazine, to freelancing, to moving out to Silicon Valley to work on the early web, and on to my current role at Google. And, uh, you know, it's hard to overstate the differences between these two worlds of the tech industry and, and news media. And I have to ask myself, you know, what do we still have in common? Um, and of course, there are actually quite a few things, right? Importantly, for the purposes of, of uh, my talk today, there's the shared role that we have in keeping the public informed uh, about both their personal interest and matters of civic importance. But one other thing that our industries uh, have in common is this. In its own way, each follows the money, right? Journalists do this to discover the hidden exercise of power. The tech industry does this to fund its latest enthusiasm, or rather, the enthusiasms themselves are driven by the flow of capital. And that's why you see hundreds of millions of dollars flow to pets.com or an app that enables you to say yo to a, a user of the same app or a bike lock that emits a foul stench when thieves try to tamper with it. And of course, a machine that does 50 different blood tests almost instantly, or, or maybe not. Uh, 
But perhaps more important than the money wasted on failures and frauds is the money spent on success. Uh, I had a job many years ago uh, running a news personalization team in a relatively large company that also had a very significant ad network and uh, successful uh, content recommendation systems at that time were still uh, more or less an emerging science. And there had been some progress made by, uh, notably by Netflix and, and Yahoo at the time, Google, um, many others. Um, but I went to an internal summit at the company for the various personalization teams so that I could learn more particularly about the ad targeting technology the company had developed. To make a long story short, they were way ahead of us, right? The ads team had a comparatively uh, massive team of engineers and math PhDs modeling behavior and incrementally notching better and better performance. Good personalization and advertising immediately translates into revenue. So the investments are pretty easy to justify. On the content side, the relationship is quite a bit less direct. And so the investment in making people happy with good content targeting was much less uh, than the investment that had been made in making them a little bit less unhappy with good ad targeting. And the obstacles to success were quite a bit greater. Um, at the conference, I uh, remember pointing this out to the executive leading the ad side that, you know, uh, advertising had the advantage of always being a false positive. People didn't ask for the ad and they don't really want it. So any minor improvement you can make in the advertising targeting makes it feel less irrelevant and it's great progress, e even at the cost of making other things marginally worse. But content personalization starts with the opposite assumption that everything will be relevant. And if it's not, it's a failure users have a pretty low tolerance for false positives. And if the algorithm screws up a few times showing users things they're not interested in, they start to lose uh, confidence in the product and you lose your audience. With ads, it hardly matters. They didn't come for the ads anyway. So, uh, you know, sh showing an ad that isn't quite relevant because of the algorithm didn't improve things isn't really any different from showing ads generally. So the two domains require a little bit different thinking. This uh, very important executive I was talking to uh, kind of looked off in the distance as I was saying this, and uh, maybe he was struck, you know, by a uh, thought that was new to him. And, and, and I thought, this is, uh, this is it. This is my moment. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm impressing uh, this important figure. And, uh, and uh, maybe he was going to see, you know, uh, we'll be able to take this investment that he had made in ad targeting and bring it to bear on the content experience and make it much better for everyone. And, uh, and then having integrated uh, this new perspective into his thinking, he, he turned his gaze back to me and he looked at me with absolute confidence and he said, yeah, I don't care. And, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, there are a lot of companies uh, to work at in Silicon Valley. Uh, and look, you know, it's not an important ethical question, right? There was no great consequence for society that hung in the balance of uh, the fact that 10 times as much effort was put into targeting advertising as was put into targeting news articles. The point really is that he revealed something fundamental to my naive self at that time. I don't care is really the default response of capital to the needs of a civil society. Capital does not care. It cares only about shareholder value. So enormous resources get put into machine learning in order to chisel a fraction of a penny in a high speeding, uh, high speed trading operation or to make my photo album look a little bit prettier, but not maybe into how to recognize fraud being perpetrated by businesses taking advantage of a government subsidy program. And the research tools available to the average entry-level paralegal will far outstrip what all but the most advanced newsrooms can give to their reporters. Of course, it's larger than tech. I don't care is the default response of capital. It affects 
how capital flows in all industries. Yeah, it shapes how venture capital is invested and how tech companies reinvest earnings, but also how private equity, also known as vulture capital, looks at harvesting value from news organizations. It affects what medical ailments and drugs get studied. And media companies are no different. When confronted with the harm that some of their favorite regulatory efforts might cause to user privacy or the integrity of search engines or the health of the open web, we hear the same refrain from them. I don't care. Doesn't matter what industry or company, really. Your owners and shareholders want more. I raise the pervasiveness of this problem, uh, a fundamental problem of capitalism and culture, not so that we can all despair and decide to move off to a remote ranch and hide uh, uh, un until the darkness uh, falls over all of us, uh, rather uh, so that we can act together to make things better. Now, I will not abuse your hospitality too much by using this as an opportunity to propagandize for Google, but I will at, at least say this. One of the reasons that I can be happy in my current job is that I feel an ability to act towards solutions. I'm allowed to care. And this is an attribute that I treasure about the company. And I believe it's one of the reasons consumers go to Google as a solution to misinformation, uh, you know, to clarify if a claim is true or not, rather than seeing it as one of the causes, right? We're allowed to care about the authoritativeness of our search results and about how search, were it not for that concern, could become gamed by purveyors of misinformation. More than that, we're rewarded for caring. We're told we should care about the health of the content ecosystem that we distribute traffic to. We're encouraged to experiment with ways to make it healthier, uh, how to make sure diverse and authoritative voices are brought into search results, uh, how to reward original reporting over aggregators and rewriters. We're allowed to care about how COVID was disrupting already fragile news businesses and to deploy money in the form of the Journalist Emergency Relief Fund to shore up you know, over, I think, a thousand small newsrooms in Latin America alone. Um, and we're allowed to care about big questions at the intersection of society and technology, like the one I mentioned already that concerns me a lot. Given how much change and disruption has affected the news industry, its distribution, its business model, how can it be that the craft of journalism has changed so little? Yeah, the existence of online resources has made some things much more convenient. Search engines, Google and others uh, themselves provide great advance and utility. But for the most part, the same laborious work of developing sources, getting access to documents, finding connections between people and organizations involved in the story, uh, doing interviews, transcribing, writing, checking, all that remains unchanged. The transmission of information and, and, and commerce have become far more efficient in so many ways over the years. You know, the way we do banking or make travel arrangements, uh, the way we watch movies, read books, file taxes, all of these things have changed dramatically. But the way journalists gather information and the way transparency is defended in civil society has really changed pretty little. So here's the particular question my team asked itself. If we presume that we have permission to care, how would we think about optimizing new technologies for the practice of journalism? The first tangible output from this process was a product called Pinpoint. We knew that journalists regularly come into possession of large caches of documents, whether through FOIA responses or other sources. And that often these documents were marginally searchable, sometimes hard even to read, uh, and sometimes in difficult formats. Um, and, and a tremendous amount of labor was spent manually reading through the documents and looking for entities, people, places, things, certain keywords. We also knew that you know, machine learning had made huge advances in text recognition across many languages. And we surprised even ourselves when we wired up the latest version of Google's text extraction libraries and saw the results. Names written by hand, writing in the margin of a document, upside down, sideways documents, fine print on the label of a whiskey bottle in the background of a photograph. All of these things were successfully extracted and indexed. 
We also know that over the years, Google search infrastructure had developed an extensive knowledge graph. Uh, that is uh, a repository of people, places, and things, and the relationships between them. And while the state of the art is still not perfect, of course, we've gotten pretty good at looking at a name and the surrounding text and figuring out how to disambiguate who or what is being written about. So we plug that into the product as well. And so not only would text be extracted from difficult document formats, but all the people and the organizations and places would be extracted and organized and displayed as well. When we had done this, we tested it with a, a large collection of documents that had been released by the U.S. government related to the assassination of, of uh, President John F. Kennedy. The power of the solution was revealed to us by what we thought was a bug. When we selected Lee Harvey Oswald from the entities that had been extracted from the documents, we immediately got the subset of documents containing Oswald. But the system also seemed to be including a person named Hedell, and our engineers didn't understand what they'd done wrong. Uh, after investigating it, they found something unexpected. Hedell was a pseudonym used by Oswald. Now, the Google Knowledge Graph knew this, even though we didn't. That episode, where the system uh, actually did a better job uh, in extracting information from the file than we would have done you know, manually reading it, started to reveal to us the potential power of the system. These capabilities really, you know, should be commonplace uh, as part of any reporter's toolkit. You know, we're in the third decade of the 21st century, and reporters shouldn't be wasting their time doing tedious machine tasks, recognizing words and characters, and searching and filtering and highlighting terms. Uh, they should be sifting through the end product of those operations, looking for meaningful connections. You know, the recognition of shapes, patterns, objects, and entities is a core strength of computing. Recognition of meaning is the province of human insight. We should be having reporters spend more time doing the latter, less time doing the former. We also looked at the development of transcription technology. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, machine transcription of audio was basically useless. 10 years ago, it started to get interesting. Five years ago, it worked fantastically if uh, what you were saying was something that resembled a search query. Uh, today, while, uh, you know, like the entity recognition, the results are not perfect, uh, I would say computer transcription is very usable in major languages and could certainly save an enormous amount of time and money. Uh, for this reason, we also added audio transcription as a built-in part of Pinpoint. So audio files uploaded to Pinpoint are automatically transcribed and organized like any other file type. Free transcription is also available now in the Google Recorder app, which records live audio and provides real-time transcription as it does so. Again, time spent by a journalist typing out a transcript is time taken away from the work of insight and discovery. The amount of time reporters have spent over the years painstakingly typing interview transcripts can never be recovered, of course, but we don't have to keep living that way in the future. Another enormous tax on reporting we discovered when we went out into the field and talked to people uh, happens, of course, with structured data. And I'm sure this will be near and dear to the heart of many people in the audience today. Uh, often, uh, structured data comes locked up in unstructured documents. And sometimes government agencies releasing the data are not exactly in a hurry to make the data easily accessible to the press. So a tremendous amount of manual effort can be required to extract the structured data and put it into spreadsheets before any analysis can begin. Um, with advances in machine learning and computer vision, the recognition of structured data should be achievable in many of the cases that were previously impossible. We're currently piloting an extension of Pinpoint that does exactly this. We've had engineers working on this for a couple of years and we think we're close enough to actually get some real world experience now. Basically, uh, the product enables you to upload your documents, uh, give the service some guidance in terms of the data you would like to extract, and the algorithm will then look for that, um, you know, matching patterns in the entire collection, extracting values, uh, putting them in spreadsheets and organizing it uh, in an automated fashion. So importing a million tax forms of the same type 
extracting that data into a spreadsheet should require roughly the same amount of time and effort as is required to import one. Over the coming months, we want to refine that product in collaboration you know, with some of our partners uh, in, in newsrooms <clears throat> so that we can ensure quality and provide mechanisms for journalisms to guide the process where ambiguity might exist or where the algorithm might get confused and, and need uh, additional help. By bringing together all of these capabilities, the transcription, extraction of text, understanding of entities, reconstruction of tabular data, we hope to remove an enormous tax from the lives of journalists and empower them to do the important journalism more easily and quickly. But we need you to help us understand how to make these tools really serve you well and grow to their full potential. There are many future directions we could take. For instance, we know user annotation is important, tagging important documents, commenting, perhaps finding new types of entities within them like addresses and dates, being able to recognize or annotate specific types of relationships represented in documents might also be important. The difference between, say, uh, uh, a personal meeting between two people uh, or a financial transaction or you know, merely being at a common event together or, or being donors to the same political campaign. Very different types of, of interactions. Um, or we could also um, you know, potentially construct an automated timeline from the events and the documents that a user has tagged as important. Uh, but we depend on you as our partners to help guide us as we prioritize future work. Let me put a little bit of a finer point on that last point around uh, collaboration. Transforming the profession, the craft of journalism should be a, a point of greater collaboration between tech companies and newsrooms, but also between newsrooms themselves uh, the changes in the distribution model for news, the fact that any person can easily access news produced anywhere in the world, has also changed how journalists uh, can think about collaboration. Historically, in the United States, and I, I think this is true of Brazil as well, uh, journalists have thought a lot more about competition than about collaboration. How do I beat my competitors to press with the story? Um, in a world where, you know, a hundred different newspapers are covering the same uh, national stories and same uh, political events in a country, it makes sense to think that way. But as national desks at regional and local press have diminished or gone away, it starts to make much more sense to think about collaboration, about how to work together with other newsrooms to bring the goal of transparency to society. After all, the important thing is that citizens can be informed about what their government and other sources of power are doing and how these activities affect their lives. And we've seen very fruitful collaborations by such organizations as the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, uh, most recently with the Pandora Papers and previously the Panama Papers, many other similar projects. In the States, we see these sorts of collaborations organized by publishers like ProPublica. Uh, in, in Brazil, we saw this when national publishers came together to ensure that accurate COVID data continued to be available to the public throughout the pandemic. We've tried to support that basic capability, collaboration inside the newsroom and beyond individual newsrooms, by letting journalists share the data that they put into Pinpoint with other journalists. And in fact, we've worked with some organizations to curate useful data sets and make them available to all of the journalists on the platform to gesture at what we think the platform could achieve in the future. So why do I wanna do this? Why do we care about uh, turning this tool into a platform that aggregates a, a, a lot of documents across newsrooms? Well, um, part of the reason I raise this question is that one, one thing I've discovered since working at Google is that uh, no matter what you do at Google, someone is going to attribute uh, to it a brilliant nefarious plan to take over the world. Uh, it's often very impressive. These uh, people show a lot of imagination, I think, just to come up with so many brilliant, nefarious plans. Um, I mean, really, if it were only uh, that easy to take over the world, uh, you know, we, we'd be all set. After all, you know, Alphabet comprises dozens of products and many separate companies from self-driving cars to drone delivery to attempts to make people live longer and, uh, and of course, search. 
Um, but I'm afraid the only one of these that it really makes a ton of money is search. And it, it, it makes so much money, it, it would probably be a little silly to think that anyone in the Google Finance Department really cares about my efforts to aggregate public documents. However, in this case, I do have a secret plan and I'm going to ruin it by telling you exactly what it is. And what it is, is transparency. I want to build tools that are so useful to you that I end up tempting you into creating a world of much, much greater transparency. Because the only way I see to get out of the doubt, the disorder that the world is mired in now around, you know, what can be trusted and who can be trusted is to do a much better job of showing our work. And that means primary sources. The tablet magazine uh, in the United States recently published a series of articles about COVID and the development and promotion of vaccines and about the vaccine skepticism that followed. The article uh, goes into great lengths to point out that authorities repeatedly undermine their own credibility by failing and at times refusing to show their work. This was true of government agencies, pharmaceutical companies, and uh, news publishers as well. And in this failure, they created these double standards, which encouraged cynicism and fanned the flames of skepticism and conspiracism. And we all know this old adage that sunlight is the best disinfective. But we don't always do the best job of taking it to heart. One of the amazing things about the work that the ICIJ and similar organizations do is that they make primary sources broadly available to journalists. But for the most part, the whole universe of public documents released to journalists, say, in response to FOIA requests, remain locked up in individual newsrooms or in private repositories of individual journalists. And of course, you know, that's understandable when you're working on a story and you don't necessarily want to hand over these assets to your competitors. But as I've said, I hope that the tools that Google builds can help you be very effective in that private period of investigation but I also hope that afterwards, after the story is published, you may see the good that can come from sharing that data with the wider community. We want to make that effortless for you because I believe doing so at scale and over time can unlock a really transformative future. And that is to say, if we can all work together to build an unparalleled aggregation of public data, we may unlock an ability to take the entities and terms that you're looking for and discover them somewhere else in a data set you'd never thought to examine, may not even know existed. Imagine a world where you're trying to find a connection between a shell corporation and an individual and some other document obtained by a journalist in another country for a completely unrelated purpose reveals that the two entities listed the same address in two different documents. Imagine a product that not only makes that broad search available, but sends you an alert notifying you that this document has come online and asking if you'd like to see it. Possibly it could show you documents from many different sources that connect chains of entities together that help you unlock a story. Of course, this sort of transparency would only be possible if the collections of documents grow to massive scale over time. And that growth would only be possible if we learn to work together and trust each other in a much deeper way than we do today. Is such a thing possible? Well, I, I don't know. It requires a leap of faith at a time when, you know, leaps of faith are not particularly in favor. It requires that we would trust each other at a time of great mistrust. It requires that we step aside from the view that, uh, our institutions are going to be perfect and infallible, and as soon as they're not, we immediately want to discard them. Um, and it requires that we move beyond kind of narrow self-interest that, that makes us uh, only concerned about our bottom line, right? It requires that we give ourselves permission to care. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I hope that, uh, that out of events like these, uh, we find uh, a path that we can all come together and say, uh, let's give ourselves permission to care. Let's, let's try to create something with our work that doesn't just embody effort. It also embodies our values and our dreams. Thank you.